All right, good afternoon. My name is Josh Berger. I'm the police chief here at the Pasadena Police Department. Last name is B-R-U-E-G-G-E-R. -G -G -E here to talk about a uh, murder that we had yesterday here in Pasadena that ended up over in Houston. I think I'd be remiss um, before I get going with remarks um, that the beginning of October began Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And as you probably came in, you probably saw the purple ribbons out on the trees. And so um, it, it's, I guess, timely that we're having this discussion here today. And actually two days from now on Thursday, we're gonna have a press conference here um, kicking off Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so um, I guess it's unfortunate that I'm having to stand here today and, and talk about this. Um, when it's supposed to be a time to raise awareness. <clears throat> so yesterday at 3823 Red Bluff here in Pasadena around 9.51 a.m., um, our dispatch center received um, two calls from two witnesses um, regarding a male assaulting a female in the parking lot. Um, the male who was later identified as Daniel Chacon, 30 years of age, um, he resides there in the apartment complex, um, was seen dragging a female um, who was the victim in this case uh, Myra Gutierrez uh, into a vehicle. It was her vehicle, um, and he had a gun in his hand. Um, responding officers uh, quickly entered the victim's vehicle and state and national databases as stolen and the victim as missing and endangered. Um, investigators got to work pretty quick after we got the information. Um, members of the Houston Police Department located the victim's cell phone um, discarded along the roadway in the 7700 block of the South Loop East in Houston, which is over in front of the I call it the old YMCA over there if you're familiar with the area. Um, and then a short time later, the victim's vehicle containing the deceased victim was located in the 5300 block of Cedar Crest in Houston by members of the Houston Police Department. Um, I do want to thank um, the Houston Police Department for their cooperative, cooperative spirit on this um, and their assistance. Um, being that we had already begun to investigate it, um, we have taken the lead on the investigation um, despite the victim being located in Houston. As you know, the suspect is currently charged with aggravated kidnapping. His whereabouts as of right now are unknown, um, but we have numerous resources out there trying to find him. I'm confident that somebody knows where he is, um, and we're asking for the public's help um, in finding him. And you can rem remain anonymous by calling Crime Stoppers at 713-222-TIPS. Um, and just before coming down here, I spoke with the district attorney's office um, and they're reviewing the current case, the aggravated kidnapping case, and are considering upgrading charges. Um, through this investigation, we learned the victim and the suspect have had an off and on two year relationship and they share a five month uh, old child together. The victim prior to this assault um, was at the suspect's apartment to visit their child. And sometime between September 1st of last month and September 14th, the victim moved out of that apartment. She was living with the suspect there, but sometime during that, that two week time period um, moved out. I believe most of you are also aware that um, there is a history between the victim and the suspect, at least here with, um, in Pasadena. Um, I'll run thro through those two cases really quick. Um, on September 1st, 2022, um, the suspect in this case actually called the Pasadena police. I'm um, reporting that the victim um, was driving a vehicle with their child intoxicated. Um, officers got out there investigated. They learned that she was not intoxicated. And during the course of the investigation, she made allegations of an assault that had occurred several days prior um, there at the apartment. Um, she alleged during this assault that there was a firearm involved. Um, officers were diligent. They lawfully searched the apartment and no firearm was located um, to corroborate um, what she had said. Despite her telling the officers that she did not want to pursue charges, um, the officers contacted the Harris County District Attorney's Office about potential charges, um, and they were declined at, at the time. Um, the case was referred to our Family Violence uh, Division, where it was assigned to an investigator to follow up and try to secure additional information or evidence for potential charges. Um, one other thing that we did um, on September 7th, we contacted the Bridge Over Troubled Waters, which is a, a, one of our partner agencies that provides services um, as an advocate for victims of domestic violence, uh, we reached out to them and provided them with the victim's information um, in hopes that they could try to reach out and contact her. <clears throat> On September 14th, um, at about 9 a.m., the victim went over to the suspect's apartment there on Red Bluff. Um, she had moved out at this time to visit uh, their five-month-old son. Uh, while they were there, there was a disturbance um, and an assault occurred. Uh, where the victim reported that the suspect grabbed her by the hair and drug her through the apartment. 
The victim reported the suspect had assaulted her numerous times in the past. Several hours after this occurred, she contacted the, the Pasadena Police Department. Uh, we responded, went out there, uh, took all the information, took a report, tried to locate the suspect at that time with negative results. <clears throat> Again, uh, officers contacted the district attorney's office about charges. However, they declined at the time and asked us to refer it to family violence investigators uh, for further follow-up. Um, so the same investigator had both the case from the 1st and the 14th. Um, you know, the one thing I want to say is charging decisions by the DA's office have to be based on evidence um, to establish probable cause. And a significant factor in that is that the victims um, have ongoing conversations with investigators, and we have to rely on uh, the victims for this evidence. Um, yeah, we'll close here just now. Uh, the domestic violence is a crime that we take very serious. Um, we actually, the first agency in the state, um, that we have started a partnership with the district attorney's office, um, uh, the Bridge Over Troubled Waters, and, and some other social services to identify high-risk victims of intimate partner violence to try to break the cycle. So from an initial look, I believe our officers and investigators followed protocols, but this case highlights how quickly these cases can evolve. Investigators and officers are invested in these cases, and when a tragedy like this strikes, we always look to see if there's anything that we can do better. And again, we're going to have a press conference on Friday, uh, Thursday um, to kick off Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And I'll take any questions. Can you tell us how old Ms. Gutierrez was? She was 38, and he was 30. And the suspect. Thir how she died? Uh, gunshot wound. Did the father have custody, or was there any custody agreement? Uh, my understanding is he had custody. <coughs> We don't know for sure. Um, I know he's got ties to Mexico, but I'm told that he hasn't spoken to them in a number of years. <clears throat> I guess, I think our big thing is what do you want people to take away from that? Because I know that this family feels like, you know, she did reach out to police, she reached out so many times, you're saying there wasn't enough evidence. <clears throat> so what is the takeaway? What should people do in this situation? So the biggest thing is trying to get out of it. What, what I'll tell you anecdotally, what I see is oftentimes not having the resources to get out. And so while, you know, criminal charges is one solution, the other is having the resources. Um, you know, there's oftentimes, uh, you know, a lot of mental abuse that goes on in these cases as well, and so becoming reliant, um, you know, disconnecting them from family members, um, they don't work, and so they become reliant on the abusers oftentimes. And so to me, really the important thing is, is trying to break that cycle. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, criminal charges oftentimes are one step in that, but there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes to try to break that cycle. And that's where, you know, the resources that are out there and, and trying to connect folks. Um, you know, the Bridge Over Troubled Waters uh, is a great, you know, resource for that um, and, and family members. Because oftentimes, you know, people are aware that this is going on, but um, it, it's reporting it and then staying involved through the process after you report it. Is the system kind of failing? Like, how are y'all working with this? Just because your agency has been involved in this case for months now. Right. So we have to have, you, you know, victims' cooperation throughout the process. Um, you, you know, and again, you know, decisions are based on evidence, and, you know, we have to have cooperation of the victims, you know, for evidence. You know, the, the offense that occurred or the report that was made on September 1st, that was actually from several days prior um, where she made the allegation. And so... You know, the, the officers, again, at this point, they, they search the apartment to try to corroborate that, you know, the gun, those things. And so, you know, they took the steps um, to try to, you know, take it to take it to its end. Um, and that's why it was signed to an investigator at that point, because what other evidence can we find? Something, you know, I say to push it across the finish line to get to probable cause. <clears throat> and Chief, just kind of sticking to that point, the family at this point is blaming Pasadena police for what they think failure to prevent Um, we took this very serious from the beginning. Um, we, again, tried to connect with our, you know, oftentimes family violence victims don't want to cooperate with the police for whatever reason. And so we realize that. And so, you know, this case and other cases, we'll refer over to, again, the bridge because there, there's sometimes, I guess you could say, a friendlier face than law enforcement or perceived as a friendlier face than law enforcement. And so, you know, having different avenues, if the criminal justice system isn't the avenue you know, that the person wants to take, that there are other avenues that are out there um, rather than, again, 
just criminal charges. And, you know, and I will tell you this, you know, the investigator, um, you, you know, did his due diligence in, you know, trying to, to, to bring the case to a, to a conclusion. Where was the child when uh, the assault, when can you say where the child is now in this or her case? Um, the child is safe with family members. Um, I believe um, the child was at the apartment. Um, there was a uh, his new girlfriend, I guess you could say, it was living with him there at the apartment. And so the child was there um, with the new girlfriend. What would your message to this suspect be if he was watching this right now? turn yourself in, we're going to find you. Um, whether it's today or tomorrow, we will find you. <laughs> so I just want to confirm the last few incidents were September 1st and September 14th or 7th? 14th. 14th. So the, the one on that was reported on the 1st actually took place on August 28th. Um, and then the other one was on the, happened on the morning of the 14th and it was reported um, around 1 o'clock in the afternoon on the 14th. So all of this recently happened? Yes. Leading up to yesterday time of death here. yes um, and you mentioned the same investigator was on both incidents did the investigator try to press for more or just once they went to the DA's office that their hands were tied at that point the, the investigator made attempts to contact the victim um, several attempts to contact the victim um, and again this is where we've got to have cooperation with the victim because to say we were stuck at that point, um, from what the, the initial responding officers had to what the investigator had was nothing new. It's, it's the same. And so that's where we need, you know, cooperation throughout the process to try to secure new evidence or something to get to the probable cause threshold. You know, at that point, if his background is ever looking into the prior cases. I am not sure of that. <clears throat> Only the one suspect, that's correct. <clears throat> what, what's the possible timeline of charges being updated? I know they want to move pretty quick on that. Um, what my quick and what the DA's office is quick sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's different um, just because of the, 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 you know, the legal thresholds we got to get through. So. Is the uh, weapon found? Uh, to this point, it has not been located. <clears throat> Sure can. Statement in Spanish, Raul. <coughs> Anything else for me? Raul, so, step forward. So is there any chance that anybody else could be involved? Like, I know you said that the girlfriend was inside. Is there any chance that she could also be charged for this? At this point, we don't have any evidence that anybody else was involved or assisted him. Um, but that's the other thing. Anybody that helps him hide from this point forward, they could be charged. <coughs>